Hey everybody, welcome to our final lecture for week eight from our Extreme Economies book, where we turn to look at Akita Japan and the story of aging demographics in Japan and its implications for the broader world. So as Davies notes, Akita, one of the prefectures in Japan, represents the kind of oldest population there in Japan with the average age of over 53 years old. And as Davies notes, about half of the Japanese population today is over 50, and a third of the population is over 65. So as he suggests, thinking about the future, how will we be able to cooperate, think about informal economies and traditions to solve economic challenges? And in more sort of a broad sense, how will we as a global society deal with this challenge of an increasing aging population and the resource strains and other social pressures that come with an increasingly aging population? So if we look a little bit more broadly at global life expectancy, in 1960, and could imagine the average person living to about 52 years old. But by 2016, that number had jumped to 72, so 20 extra years of living just in that roughly 56 year period. And if we think about Japan in particular, in the turn of the century in 1900, the average Japanese lived to about 45 years old, and the average age of the population was about 27. So you had 44 million people, many of them having five kids in a family. But today, in 2020, the average Japanese might live to 84 years old, the average age being 47, and now 127 million people, but importantly, as Davies notes, only having 1.4 children. So a dramatic increase in age in that 120 year period, but a dramatic drop in the number of children that are being born within Japanese families. And you can see that demographic change on the right there in that graphic from 1950 to 2020, or a slow but gradual life expectancy increase within the Japanese population. Now, economists have tried to make sense of how do we as individuals adapt to some of these challenges. One of the economists that Davies talks about is Franco Medigliani, who is an Italian-American economist who came up with what was known as the life cycle hypothesis. And essentially, Medigliani argued that over the course of our life, we try to balance out our savings and our spending in order to create a, essentially an equilibrium so that when we are doing better, we save more. And when things are tight, we spend as much as we can to try to maintain a relatively even and consistent um, lifestyle or what Medigliani called the life cycle. So. If the goal over time is to try to have a relatively stable um, lifestyle, Digliani tried to think about how does that shape economic behavior and consumer behavior in terms of our savings practices and our spending practices. And he argued that we could extrapolate from how individuals do this up to sort of the society level in order to develop a general theory to explain consumer savings and spending. And this is uh, in a simplified version of what this life cycle hypothesis looks like. So he argued we have sort of three main phases of our life. So in this chart, you can see here, the green dash line represents sort of spending in relation to our lifestyle. And the red line indicates our income over the course of our life period. And then he argued these three phases begin with dependency. So this would be when we're young up to maybe essentially the time that people, um, if they were going to high school or sort of left the home, income is very low. But then as you age and get to that second stage of maturity, your income level will increase. Although as he notes here, there's a good likelihood that you may have some ups and downs over the course of that period of your life. But in general, as you can see there, the income goes up and then by the time you get to retirement you're not making as much money but you're still trying to maintain that same standard of living as you move into kind of the retirement third phase of your life 
And so Medigliani argued that over the course of those dependency, maturity, retirement, individuals will always try to maximize both their savings and their spending in order to try to maintain a relatively stable lifestyle. And one of the challenges, however, in thinking about that, as Davies argues, is that we tend to think about a long life as a good thing, particularly in context of advancing societies, improving overall health um, and social services for increasingly aging populations. Um, but the life cycle model from Modigliani suggests that there can be an unexpected jump in life expectancy that could shock both individuals and the entire economy. And this is in part the dynamic that Japan helps illustrate because now people are living longer and in particular living longer after they've stopped working. So in that sort of third phase of retirement. And so how do we make sense of that change where now a century later or a generation or two later, people are living much longer, but not just continuing to generate income individually, but yet still needing state services, um, social security, welfare, Medicare, Medicaid in the context um, of the United States um, and similar social welfare systems in other countries such as Japan. So if we look, for example, Davies argues that around $1,700 a month is the average Japanese man's pension, while $1,000 a month is the average Japanese woman's pension. And this, of course, has to do with the historical dynamic of more Japanese men employed in the labor force, and so um, having much more money put into um, their pensions, and also just more Japanese men in general um, involved in the labor force, particularly um, up until the last generation Japanese. But as he notes, importantly, 50% of pensioners have no other income. So an increasingly large number of Japanese who are retiring don't have any supplemental income. And in particular, this becomes important in the broader context of changing demographics, as Davies notes, because 50%, uh, there's been a 50% increase in pensioners in Japan in the last decade. So far more people who are drawing salaries, um, often from the state, but not generating new economic income and activity. And so if you have 10 million plus pensioners living in poverty just in Japan, a relatively small country, how do we think about these dynamics at a larger global scale? One of the ways that Japanese uh, scholars and economists have tried to think about this is through the idea of intergenerational inequity, Sedai Kan Kakosa, and in particular, why that challenge of increasing long lives and increasing resource draw on the state combined with a declining birth rate in the populations in Japan and other countries um, has larger implications for society. So in the Japanese context specifically, there's been a long history of respect for elders among Japanese. Um, Davies argues, for example, we can see this grounded at least in part in Confucian ethics and the emphasis on respect for elders as well as ancestors, Oyokoko, and Importantly, Davies notes part of the challenge as we look at the shifting dynamics in Japan and other countries is that we're starting to see a decline in respect for elders. So you can see, for example, there that the general um, strength of care for the elderly embodied in what he describes as the shiribushito, the silver seat signs that you can see there that you might find on Japanese subways and any of you that have grown up in big cities like New York, Chicago, L.A., and have ridden or used public transit have probably seen these signs telling you to make way for um, an elderly, um, disabled individuals, pregnant women and others for seating purposes. But these speak to a much deeper demographic and cultural shift, Jay Davies argues, in the context of Japan, as a younger generation is increasingly kind of critical of this aging population in Japan and the resource draw and sort of the pressure on society that comes from an increasingly older population and an increasingly shrinking younger population due to the drop in birth rates. So as he notes, there's a whole series of, kind of common phrases that have emerged in the last generation or so among Japanese to um, kind of make sense of, some of them more serious, some of them more playful such as obatarian, you know, 
making fun of these pesky middle-aged women who are very demanding and want everything done in a particular way, to uh, the kaigo jigoku, the nursing care hell and the stress and strain that many young um, healthcare workers feel involved in intergenerational healthcare, whether it's in retirement homes, um, nursing care facilities, and other um, sort of institutions. And that feeling amongst the younger population um, that they're being kind of called on to do extra work or relied on to pay for this increasingly older generation has also been impacted by the deeper or sort of broader changing role of Japanese workers in society. So one of the things Davies notes is the feeling of many salarymen who are now adrift, um, particularly if their wives are also working or they're home longer after retirement. They just don't know what to do because so much of their life was built around the sort of workday culture. And so now they're home and they don't necessarily have a clear sense of what they should be doing anymore. But at the same time, we're also seeing uh, far more Japanese women involved in the labor force and working um, outside of the home. And that's also playing an important role in these changing social and cultural dynamics. One important way these changes are also manifesting is the way that an increasing aging population is putting more stress on both society and individuals and leading to increase in suicides. And here we see a, a similar trend to what we were discussing earlier in the week with Glasgow, Scotland and the decline um, of the shipyards and increasing rates of crime, drug use and suicides across Scotland, but in Glasgow in particular. So the baby boomer population, those born between 1946 and 1964, are increasingly um, feeling and polls and other research shows growing levels of stress, loneliness, leading to suicide becoming more likely, whether that is at an individual level, but also as a kind of a broader trend across Japanese society. And this in particular, as Davies notes, we're seeing an increasing number of suicides amongst elderly who are living in poverty and described in the Japanese as Kodokushi, the lonely death phenomenon. So if we think about the overall profile of you know, who's committing suicide in Japan in recent years, the typical person would be someone who's a single divorced man somewhere between 50 and 70 years old. So precisely these pensioners who are now living longer but are no longer working and are feeling like they don't know where their place is in society or perhaps even um, in their uh, family and as these traditional family values, respect for ancestors and older generations begin to break down amongst younger populations. So if we step back a little bit from the story of Japan and look nationally, what we see is that same dynamic of elderly populations being the most vulnerable and at risk. So as you can see here from the chart, looking at 2017 data, those in the 70 plus year range are by far the most likely to commit suicide in that demographic that's most at risk from these trends. So Japan gives us, in a sense, a, a window into these broader dynamics. And as Davies notes, to think about how these are playing out at a sort of local level, one of the ways is through the emergence of these sort of ghost villages or vanishing villages across Japan, which this video helps us think a little bit more about. And you can see that link down there in the bottom to watch that video. So these vanishing videos driven in part, sorry, vanishing villages as discussed in that video are driven by these urban migration patterns and the rise of people moving out, particularly of rural areas um, into urban areas in search of jobs and new um, lifestyle opportunities. And this is leading to right, the decline of populations in these rural areas or the kind of ghost towns as Davies refers to them. So one of the examples, um, Fujisato now has a major population drop that went from 3,000 people today, but had over 5,000 people a decade ago. So you know, almost half the population vanishing in just 10 years. And importantly, as he notes, over 50% of those that are still left in Fujisato are over 65 
In last uh, summer, 2021, there were only four new babies born in the entire town. And less than 25 shops are still open, or at least were open as of 2016. That number may be even smaller today. And you can see a shot there of the essentially deserted main street running through Futisado. So these dynamics are playing out across Japan in many of these rural villages, as Davies notes, um, speaking to this worrying trend of an increasingly older population and the pressures that are coming with declining birth rates and these intergenerational tensions. But these also have important political implications, as Davies also notes. So we've seen many examples where small towns, cities, and villages have um, debated or discussed merging together in order to consolidate resources and try to address these tensions and challenges. But things like um, what name will this new kind of conglomeration of towns or cities or villages be becomes very important, particularly since the names often have long historical traditions and significance behind them. Um, but also, if they were to consolidate, then what happens to individual debts from different towns or cities or villages? Who takes those on? Uh, who becomes responsible for them? And this has broader, not just economic, but also political and cultural implications, because as Davies notes, um, there are a number of particularly smaller towns and villages where there's so few people left there that the political system itself is at risk of falling apart. So as he notes in 2015, one fifth of the local political races that were held only had one candidate running. So there was effectively no political race and no choice in political candidates. And that has also led, because of this, um, both the declining impacts of younger population not having as many children, increasing elderly and people migrating out of the rural areas to the cities. There were a growing number of these ghost houses or abandoned towns and villages, the Akia. Davies notes perhaps as many as 8 million ghost houses across Japan and 40,000 square kilometers of abandoned land as people either leave the rural areas for the city or simply die off and there's no sort of next young generation born that are staying in those rural villages and other areas. So as Davies suggests, you know, despite the fact that the sort of movement of power down to the local level has often been supported by people, we're also seeing this shortness of political individuals or those willing to run for various levels of public office. And that's led some people in some areas to think about, you know, effectively abandoning democracy altogether because there's no longer the competition or political systems there to maintain uh, that kind of traditional democratic politics. So how do we think about those kind of challenges driven by both economic, political, and cultural shifts all at the same time? However, there is perhaps a silver lining to the story, Davies notes, and this is one of the reasons that I think he picks this as one of the three examples of thinking about future economies and the challenges that come with these is that this aging population is also creating a whole new set of opportunities and challenges and potential ways to innovate in response to these dynamics that have both economic, political, and cultural sort of aspects to them. So as he notes, with almost 50 million elderly in Japan that are between 65 to 75 or older, that sort of population in Japan spends close to a trillion dollars a year. So how do we think about tapping into those markets and expanding those markets in different ways? So Davies notes that there's an emerging set of businesses and innovators focused on goods targeted specifically for an, an older population, everything from food to a variety of companion dolls, both human and sort of animal, to video games and other resources that might be more appropriate for this old and aging population. There's been an increasing interest in communal or sort of share houses, as they're often called in Japan, with 30,000 plus of these having been created so far, where the goal is specifically to create a sort of intergenerational residential setting where you have younger people and older people living together so that you have um, both that sense of family and community still intact, as well as um, people that can help sort of look after and care for increasing elder population 
in order to help offset some of those feelings of isolation that lead to the rising suicide trends that we looked at earlier. We're also seeing an increasingly um, important emphasis on technology, particularly in relation to elder care. And we've seen this in everything from developing technologies to help with kind of the labor tasks in retirement and nursing homes, but also the creation of various um, AI pets and robots as sort of companions. Some of the examples that Davies notes are Pero, Abo, and Tombots. So things like robotic dogs or robotic cats or animals that can act similar to the way that a real dog or a cat might be brought into you know, a nursing home or a residential home. And, and sort of Denison even does this, obviously, with the younger generation, you know, bringing dogs onto campus as sort of care animals for people to interact with. And there's lots of research showing the benefits of this for elderly with Alzheimer's and other kind of um, mental and cognitive diseases. So that becomes an increasingly um, important market Davies points to for thinking about where the opportunities might be amidst this aging uh, crisis that is not unique just to Japan. Another example he talks about is the quote unquote Las Vegas elder care facilities where they're trying to sort of combine entertainment and activity with um, basic health care services for elderly. And this is another one of these innovative examples where you're trying to see similar to these kind of share houses bringing together um, different generations in a way that help to offset those feelings of loneliness. So this video looks at one of these examples of what the kind of Las Vegas elder care facility looks like in practice. So when we think about all these dynamics together, Davy suggests that there are a number of different challenges that this increasing aging population poses for not just Japan, but at a global scale. And the way that we respond to that challenge in part has to do with how do we manage this increasingly aging population? Is it a kind of managed decline that we need to think about or how, what is the best way to approach that? So Davies notes here, when it becomes clear that a place is heading for extinction, markets and local democracy break down completely. And this is precisely what Davies was trying to illustrate with looking at the vanishing villages and ghost towns and the impacts both on local democratic practices, questions of local autonomy and local political decision making. And as he notes, this sort of case in Japan is also playing out in many other parts of the world, Portugal, Italy. Germany and the U.S. will not be far behind either. So for many places, the economies of the future may be one of managed decline, Davies argues. So how do we think about this dynamic or this trend as one of the three sort of key future challenges? An increasing aging population that requires more economic resources, and is creating changing political and cultural and social dynamics. How do we address those or respond to those as one of the future challenges that countries around the world will increasingly be facing in the future? Okay, that is it for this lecture today, everybody. Thank you.